Welcome to Level with Emily Reese. Tom Salta is a composer that I've interviewed many times for Level and other things about his music for the Halo series. I've interviewed him about a game called From Dust. I think that's the first time I ever interviewed him, actually. And we've talked about PUBG before. We've been together on panels and stuff. Lots of history there with Tom Salta. But rather than talking about his music today, we're going to talk about a series of classes he has online about writing music for games. You can get a discount on those classes too, if you'd like, and I'll tell you how to do that at the end of the interview. Here's Tom. The new series is called the Tom Salta Masterclass Series, and the first course, and the only course at the current moment, is called Game Music Essentials. So that is what we're going to talk about today and I, I'd love to get your reaction to it and, and thoughts and questions and all of that. Yeah, I mean the master class, it's, it's really comprehensive with your essentials and that's one of the things I, I like the most about it is you're not just talking about what it's like to actually literally write game music. You talk about the business side, you talk about all the organization that's really a good idea to do before you even write a single note. <laughs> Literally the essentials of all aspects of being in the business of writing music for games. There's so much information out there. And when you go to normally to conventions or panels or classes, the focus tends to only be on, you know, the writing, the mu the creative part. Even the university programs tend to only be on the actual creative, the writing part but they don't deal with the whole ecosystem around that. So what, what happens is you have a lot of very talented people who know music and know the theory and know, you know the, conce the concepts, but they're not ready to jump in as a professional. So what this course was designed to really do is cover everything that I wish someone told me when I started out. So it's really it's an A to Z as far as the essentials, and that's why I called it that, of everything you need to know from from the creative process to the basic understanding to of everything when it comes to game music. Uh, and, and of course, the business side and all the questions that, you know, you normally don't hear answered. So I guess what made you decide to share this knowledge on this scale? Because you've been doing panels and things at conventions for years and years. And what made you decide to, to do that? I think it was a need to be able to do it more often and share and have a wider reach. Because when I give these talks at universities and panels and, and conventions, they are typically annual things. And, you know, the rest of the year, I'm kind of isolated in a way from the ability to share this information. And I can't tell you how enjoyable it is for me to connect with people. So that's why not only did I create a course that you watch, but it also has an interactive portion to it as well, where every month anyone who takes a class can join in these live sessions with me where I can see them, they can see me, and we can have conversations. And it's basically the equivalent of, you know, after you speak on a panel, usually there's a line or, you know, people meet you out in the hallway. So I wanted to kind of recreate that and have a wider reach. Because there's so many people that just can't afford or don't have the means to go to a university program. And a lot of these uh, conventions that, I mean, just a trip out, yeah. you know, just for me to go out to, to Los Angeles or something like that, it costs a thousand dollars before I even get there, you yeah. know, just to, into the convention. So, you know, why not? There's so many talented people around the world. And I just love like, you know, just widening the reach. Yeah. So that was really the uh, impetus, I guess you would say, of, of why I wanted to do this. How long have you wanted to do this? Because, of course, right now, uh, the, the pandemic is such a huge part of everyone's life. So you're always like, oh, was this something that you decided to do because of that? <laughs> you would think so, right? The funny thing is I launched this right before the pandemic. <laughs> it just was really interesting how, how things aligned perfectly in that regard with having this available, but no, it really wasn't anything pandemic related, but it turns out that, wow, what a, what a great thing to have during a pandemic because now all the conferences were shut down. Right. So you couldn't even do that. So right. I'm so glad that I had this outlet 
you know, and then it, it opens up the possibility and the stage to do more courses. Game Music Essentials is just the beginning. But, mm-hmm. you know, the more I speak to people, the more I realize, well, someone wants to, to learn this about whatever, this topic or this topic or DAWs or reverbs or, you know, mixing or math or whatever it is. All the things that are involved in music production and not just video game related, but it also certainly is required knowledge for that world as well. So really, I mean, this is, I just love, you know, when people come into my studio, I have mentees come from New York City every year through the SEL. So I love sharing. So why not wait for these opportunities to come to me? Just, I just wanted to create them so I could go out, you know, to everybody, anytime, anywhere. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you talk about right away is just organizing, organization, figuring out your palette, figuring out all these steps, narrowing down this, narrowing down that, mapping things out. And, you know, that's kind of the nitty gritty that certainly I've had many composers talk about before, but it's still just like, that is so important, isn't it? <laughs> you know, the the longer I've been doing this and the older I get, I really notice how distinctly different the two sides of the brain work. You know, the left side, the logical thinking, analytical side, and then the right side, we refer to the creative side. And And I've said this so many times that they really don't work together at the same time very well. <laughs> because yeah. when you try to be creative, but you also have the analytics going and the thinking, you sabotage all the creative stuff. Think back to when you were in kindergarten. Can you imagine walking into a sandbox and, you know, meeting some kid and, you know, being like, yeah, I'm not creative. Yeah, I, I've just never, I can't quite get the, the perfect sandcastle or whatever. <laughs> when you're a kid, you just do it. You're not worried about your career. (laughs) You're not worried about being judged. You're not worried about, you know, the next job of making a sandcastle. It's just you do it for pure joy of creating. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that when I can tap into that and just go into that zone, right, that flow, as so many people talk about, whether you're an actor or a, a painter or a musician, there's a flow. Right. And that flow is no, nowhere to be found is the left side of the brain. <laughs> so the more you can turn that off and, and composers tend to be a bit heady, I think, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into the, this and particularly in games. My God, there's so much planning and stuff. So what I like to do is se- uh, is segment those those stages, break them up and and everything and doing preparation, all the stuff that requires planning and thinking so that I can just go and pick up a crayon and just start drawing as opposed to going through and where did I put that? And oh my God, I have six terabytes of crayons. Get all that planning done so that you can just have fun and create and, and just, you know, go like Bob Ross, you know, with the painter. He's just like, yeah, he's got his palette. He's got his cobalt, you know, whatever, cobalt white going through the colors and it's all there. So when he's painting, he's just, you know, he's not leaving the set and going mixing new colors. Right. So that that's the that's the idea, right? That's the yeah. way we want to create and and there's the better ideas, the best ideas come out that way. Yeah. Uh another thing uh that I think is really important that you bring up is the importance of being able to mix and master. I mean, mm. and it's it's more than that. It's you talk about how you need to know how to do as much as possible, right? You need to know if you can know about the middleware and how implementation works. If you can know how to mix and master, you're just helping yourself to save time and stress and all those things. If I could freeze time, you know, uh, (laughs) now, I would become a complete expert at you know, Wise and FMOD and all the middleware, you know, I'm really glad that I already knew full well how to mix and and produce even over 15 years ago, you know, in 2000 and whatever, three, when I started doing games, I already have a career, you know, doing professional mixing and mastering on records and stuff like that. So Mm -hmm. it is really, really, really helpful. And, you know, it's not... There's a lot of reasons why, but I'll just focus on two core reasons. One is the money. You know, quite frankly, when you get hired, it's usually an all-in rate, you know, whether it's a per-minute rate or what have you, and uh, they assume that you're just going to give them something that sounds really good, 
They're not interested in having you say, okay, well, I'll charge you X for minutes, but then I have to, you know, charge you another thing to mix it. It's like, wait a second, I'm just going to go to someone who can mix it, Mm -hmm. you know? And if you have to hire somebody, if you hire someone good, they're usually going to take a significant chunk out of your pay. So... Why not? I mean, it's easier than ever. You don't need a big recording studio anymore. You can do it on a laptop, for, for goodness sakes, if you know what you're doing. So, you know, getting good at the mixing is, is really important. And I'm definitely going to share my knowledge in that in future courses because that's yeah. just something that I've learned just by having to do it. Didn't necessarily enjoy it, nor did I really want to compete with engineers out there who that's all they do. But Mm -hmm. I just found it was just much more beneficial. And the other key reason is this, and this is super practical, especially when you're a composer and working on deadlines, is the speed factor. Yeah. All right, If, if I have to make a quick change and we're in a deadline, I don't need to wait and send the stems over to another engineer and have them do the mix and then wait a second, no, I don't like that, I gotta change the melody. And then the mix process, it's all done. Yep. So I can, you know, I can work really, really, really fast and my clients appreciate that. Did you make this video all by yourself or did someone help you to piece it together and edit and all of that? It, the original one started by myself. You know, you might notice that in the <laughs> in the creative process, I'm embarrassed now because I didn't actually know this would turn into what it's turned into, but I'm like in a sweatsuit, you know? <laughs> this, this is like me just giving... <laughs> You know, this wasn't going to be some big commercial operation. So it started very homegrown where I did most of it myself. Uh, and and now I have a, a small but very talented team of people that is that are helping me with a lot of the post production and 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 things because there's just so many moving parts. Yep. And especially when you're trying to do something like this, you know, I'm a full time composer. I didn't stop and say, okay, I'm going to move into teaching. No, I'm composing. Like I don't have time for this, <laughs> but I just <laughs> love, love to do it. And I don't watch much TV, so you know, I make the time. Uh, but yeah, I do have uh, some amazing uh, people that are that are helping me. Not many, but few and amazing. People who play games and people who are familiar with game music are well aware of the intensity levels of music and how that changes as you go through a game. But I love how you use music um, that you wrote for Killer Instinct uh, Season 3, and it, there's multiple low intensity tracks that cycle in and out through one fight and multiple middle intensity tracks in one fight and et cetera, up into the high levels of intensity. And that was something I was like, oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. (laughs) So talk a little bit about that. The diagram was hilarious too, that you put up for that. But yeah, go ahead and talk about that. (laughs) Yeah. You know, think about it this way, right? You know, you can easily... Uh, focus on the analytics of, well, you know, video game music is nonlinear, so I have to just compose, you know, the the low, the medium, the high, and it has to attach, so I'll do it in the same key, in the same tempo, and it'll just work, right? Mm -hmm. And that's very nice. Technically, it will work. But think about it. As a player, as a listener, I'm experiencing that music like as it were a linear piece that was planned out that way. I'm listening to something which is a custom soundtrack being played on the fly different every time, particularly in a game like you just mentioned, Killer Instinct. So the thinking behind how to structure and plan out music in advance was the idea of creating this big, long piece of music, you know, this 10-minute piece of music that had all kinds of ups and downs in it and variety that if I were to listen to it straight through all the pieces, which you can do on the soundtrack, everyone, it's fun (laughs) to listen to and it doesn't get boring. Mm -hmm. And you need variety coming from, you know, the music industry and just making music for music's sake. You know, you realize that people don't have much attention span. You know, they want changes.
It's also fun to see when you include footage from games, uh, you know, footage that they've sent you without music so that you can get a sense for what other sounds are happening. What else is going on in the environment that you need to, to work with right. throughout the process? And that's something now that I that I try to insist upon, and if at all possible, that I do get footage without music and with sound effects and dialogue, because when you're doing music, uh, it's so incredibly helpful to actually know what the music is going to be played with yeah. ahead of time before yeah. you hear it in the game itself. When I started out, I didn't have that luxury as often uh, to various extremes. The most extreme, for example, was when I did Hawks, Tom Clancy's Hawks. I literally got only a spreadsheet oh, for wow. Hawks 1. Hawks 2, I had more to work with. But Hawks 1, there was a spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't anything. There wasn't even graphic. There wasn't a screenshot. There wasn't video. There was nothing. So I, I thank goodness I realized this earlier on that uh, I should kind of know how to put this music in context. Um, so I just went online and found some other game that whatever game I could that was a jet fighter game with engine noise because I asked them, I said, could you at least tell me what what the gameplay, the mechanism is going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, what are we going to be hearing? And they said there's going to be a lot of talking and dialogue and, you know, chatter over the radio and engine noise. I said, okay. You know, so I planned on it that way and all the music that I did, you know, works with that. It's really important to be able to put it into context and, yeah. and uh, for, for all kinds of reasons, both mood-wise, creatively, and, and then just for mixing as well. You know, if there's lots of booms and explosions, you shouldn't spend much time putting big tycos and bass drums. You know, a lot of times it's nice to just stay clear of it so it all fits together nicely and it's not redundant. Because I tell composers, guess what? If your music conflicts with the sound effects and dialogue, guess who's going to lose? The music is going to be put way down low. Yeah. And you don't want that. And this also uh, kind of piggybacks into my next uh, question, which is the importance of being a team player. I think I, I find that composers often find themselves battling their ego more than other people in the, in the, the, <laughs> in the video game making world. And I think the reason, uh, a big part of the reason is that composing music tends to be very of a solo experience. A composer, many of them, uh, you know, have years and years of training and, and, you know, they're the experts in the room, usually the only expert, you know, when it comes to music. And, and quite, quite honestly, that can get to your head uh, if, you, if you allow it to, if, you, you know, if, you're, if you're more, I, I want to say immature, but you know, if you're more egoic based. Yeah. And um, I think that's, this is also something to be aware of when you're an artist, you know, because I've worked, first of all, I came from that world. And second of all, as a composer and as a producer, there have been times when I'll work with artists, you know, let's say, oh, we're, we want to have a song with this band and, you know, and I'll work with artists. And, you know, there's a drastic difference. I mean, some are incredible. They're great team players. They, 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 are not insistent that their idea is the right one and everyone else is wrong or it has to be this. But there's some that are like, who are you? You know, do you know who you're talking to? That kind of thing. So I found that, you know, in any business, it's when you're working with people, you really want to be likable. Quite frankly, you want to be likable. And I think as we've all learned on a very public scale uh, in the past couple of years, you know, it, People who are very into themselves and egoic and, and toot their own horn are not very likable. So <laughs> we don't want to be that person as a composer. We want to be very humble and confident, but not braggadocious and not ego-based. Mm -hmm. If you're getting hired as a composer to create music for a game, guess what? You're not the boss. You might be an expert. You're brought in for your expertise. But you are a team player. The music is playing a role 
and not the most important role, by the way, usually. So keep that in mind. That's pretty much the advice I will give. And so being a team player, being likable, being flexible, uh, being willing to you know, let go of a favorite idea, these are all important character um, skills, I guess you'd say, <laughs> that will help your career along. And, you know, quite frankly, I've gotten much better at that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, my ripe old age, I think I'm I'm much better than I used to be, you know, when I was 20 <laughs> or yeah. 25. I mean, you've been doing this for quite a while. Uh, I know that you're a very hard worker and you have a lot of energy, but talk to me about, if you're willing, what part of this process is the hardest for you? I don't think it's mm. the composition. So what part of it, you know, the business side, the submission side, the mm. mixing, what part of it's the hardest for you? Yeah, I, uh, I think that's a pretty easy answer. Uh, I'm glad you kind of gave me a wide playing field there. <laughs> uh, I think the hardest part about it is the pitch process which isn't always the case. And what I mean by the pitch process is when a composer is asked before getting hired to audition and yeah. usually with other composers. So you're competing against other composers and at the beginning of a project where you know the least about it, you have to sign an NDA, you work your, your, your you pour your heart and soul into something for a week or two, yet no money and you fall in love with the idea that, oh, my God, this could be amazing. This could help my career. Uh, you know, this could the, the, the money's going to be fantastic. Wow. This could change my life, you know, and you pour your heart and soul. And it, it's just you, you you make yourself incredibly vulnerable. At least I do <laughs> when I'm creating and uh, and then only to leave yourself open to be rejected. Right. It hurts. It hurts. Yep. I mean, it's necessary. Right. I mean, in any kind of situation that's creative, including relationships, the only way it's really going to work is if you leave yourself open to be hurt, you know, yeah. but to do it right, to do a pitch right, you really got to pour your heart and soul into it. At least I do. Yeah. And I hate, I hate that part. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that part. I mean, fortunately it doesn't happen a lot anymore. Uh, but you know, still sometimes it's just company policy and it's just the game. I mean, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, famous big actors have to go on an audition. I mean, it's just sometimes it's just a question of which amazing actor is the right choice for the role. And yeah. that's usually the way it comes down to um, when I'm pitching on a project. I mean, the, you know, the people I'm pitching against, I know all of them. They're amazing yeah. people and they're amazingly talented. It's like any one of them is going to be great. Yep. But it gives them a choice of, well, which one is going to maybe have the right, you know, chemistry or DNA or whatever it is that that helps them make the decision. So mm -hmm. I get I think that's clearly the worst most heart-wrenching part of this world that I often live in is that pitch process. So other than the composition, given that there are all these other parts to it, what's one of your favorite parts that you maybe didn't realize came along with being a game composer and you're like, wow, I really love that I get to do that as a game composer? Well, you know, th there's a myriad of answers for that one. Um, quickly, uh, I think sometimes because I'm such an 80s child and I came from the pop music industry, whenever I get a chance to do something that sounds like a throwback uh, track, where I can kind of break out all the 80s-centric synths and drum machines and reverbs and music production techniques. I'm like a kid in a candy store. And I've had a chance to do that so many times, like especially with Just Dance, with that series, which yeah. a lot of people don't realize that I did a lot of the original music in that. Uh, and also the covers. Nice. So I'm thinking, I remember like I had to do the song from Flash Dance, What a Feeling. Like, <laughs> yeah, I do. You know, it gave me a chance to lose myself in that song and recreate the exact sounds and the prophet nice. synths and, you know, break out the lexicon reverbs and, and you know, record the vocals like I was doing the real sessions. God, I love I love that part. Um, but but talking in general about scoring 
the, the scoring process, you know, getting any game, whether it be a Killer Instinct or a Halo or a Prince of Persia or, you know, a thousand other kind of types of games. I think the favorite part for me is it's like the, the scariest and the favorite at the same time is the beginning is the beginning hmm. where the you don't have a lot of pressure on you. Um, because the deadline is way off in the distance and you have this brand new, like inspiring thing you've just fallen in love with, you know, that you're yeah. like, oh, the sky's the limit. And it allows me to just be that kindergartner going to the sandbox <laughs> and just play. And, you know, some of it's going to work and some of it won't work. Yeah. But I just love that sandbox, that phase one that I like to talk about in the creative process. And when you throw stuff out, so to speak, you don't ever really throw it out, right? You tuck it away into an ideas box of sorts? Yeah, I literally have an ideas folder that I create for every project. And um, what I will often do, particularly when there's a very big score involved, you know, when, I, you know, like... I remember in in uh, in the game music essentials, I talk about Halo, you know, as one of them. Uh, and you know, I created a folder of I think I had what twenty something ideas, just random ideas of of different melodies or motifs or sounds or chord progressions. And uh, I just love that because it it brings me back to when literally I was in eighth grade with my first synth. Yeah. I mean, I just explored the thing. You know, I still have it. I'm looking at it up there. It's got, wow. you know, what has it got? 32, 64 sounds in it, the JX3P. And that's what I used to do. I'd be like, sound one. Ooh, sound two. Ooh, and you just start, sometimes the sound itself makes you get creative. It's like you just get lost in it. You start vibing yeah. with it. So now that I have, you know, too many sounds, literally more than I should have, uh, gets in the way sometimes. Uh, whenever I can kind of just take my time and just play and be, you know, go back to those days where I was just able to explore my sounds and just ideas and not worry about someone standing over my shoulder saying, no, that's not going to work for this project or no, that's not the right kind of melody or, you know, because sometimes with these ideas, I might come up with something random that would work in something else. Yeah. So yeah. I have lots of saved ideas. From what I understand, people who listen to this interview can get a little uh, get a little discount on the courses for the masterclass. Tell us about that. Absolutely, yes. I am making sure that you have a fifty dollars off code to share with your listeners for the um, for the game music essentials. Uh, and in addition to that, which is really amazing, I'm so thrilled to announce that we have some major software developers that are coming on board to offer huge discounts. Oh, wow. Uh, up to 50% discounts on libraries that can cost thousand plus dollars. That's more savings than the course even costs. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. cheaper to just buy the, the, the game music essentials and then buy all that software. So yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, incentives and, and reasons that anyone who's really interested in this world would would definitely, I think, get a lot out of it. and. Certainly an additional $50 off doesn't hurt for, for all of your listeners. I appreciate that very much. And uh, listeners, do not have you don't have to be a patron, but do go to our Patreon page to find the code. But you don't have to be a patron. Just go to where this episode is posted, and the code will be right there. You copy and paste it, and uh, that'll be good, good to go for you. So thank you again for that. website, if you would. TomSalta.com slash masterclass. Or if you go to TomSalta.com, up in the upper right, you'll see a link that says masterclass. Perfect. And you can go there and uh, you'll see everything you need to go and sign up. Thank you for everything as always. Thank you, Emily. So great to be here with you.
Thanks for listening to episode 148 of Level with Emily Reese. You can get $50 off Tom Salta's masterclass by entering level 50 as a coupon uh, at checkout. And I'll also post that code on our Patreon page just if you want to visually see it, but it is level 50. That'll get you 50 bucks off Tom's masterclass. And you can find that and a playlist at patreon.com slash level. I'm Emily Reese. Sam Keenan is our producer. Say hi, Sam. Hi. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Level with Emily. And learn more about us at levelwithemily.com, made possible by Adam Selvage at Tiki Web Services and composer Brad Gentle. Level with Emily Reese is a production of June Media, Inc. <laughs>